Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Today, I'm going to be covering the case of Robert Leeming, who I've seen called Canada's Chris Watts. And it probably has a lot to do with the interviews that he did, evading law enforcement, the dumping of the bodies, the list goes on. I want to jump directly into this case today, and I want to start off by talking a little bit about the victims of this case. September of 2018, 25-year-old Jasmine Levitt and her 22-month-old daughter, Aaliyah, were living in Calgary, Alberta. It seems like Jasmine split up with Aaliyah's father shortly after Aaliyah was born, and so Jasmine was a single mother. And being single, Jasmine decided to go on some dating apps to see what was out there. Maybe she could find some love again. And that is where she stumbled across 34-year-old Englishman Robert Leeming. Two started talking and things started to get more serious over the next couple weeks. But one thing led to another and in October of 2018, so just a couple weeks after they had started talking, Jasmine ended up needing a new place to live and Robert offered for her and Aaliyah to live with him. And they could move into his townhome with him in the Cranston suburb as long as she, you know, contributed to some rent. Now, Genevieve, who's Jasmine's sister, ended up being quoted saying, I was concerned because Jasmine said she was going to move in with Robert despite only having known him for a couple weeks to a month. Naturally, as a sister, I had my concerns. Genevieve also claimed that they were moving too fast and described their relationship as volatile. She also said that they were often arguing. Genevieve saying, it was very strange. It's like emotionally, it wasn't quite on the level you'd think a relationship would be. I know Jasmine talked about having some issues and getting Robert to open up. Now, despite all of the issues that seemed that Jasmine and Robert had, very few weeks to months into their relationship, Robert was very attentive to co-parenting Aaliyah. Robert would cook for the little 22-month-old. He would put her to bed. He would also watch Aaliyah while Jasmine had to go run errands. Jennifer actually said he almost seemed to care more about Aaliyah than he did Jasmine. So clearly things weren't perfect in the start of this relationship, but where did things go terribly wrong? Well, it turns out that Robert had a very dark past. Robert was actually born in a British military base in Germany to a British military officer. His parents and him would eventually move back to England to the town of Marlborough. They lived in the quiet countryside and Robert would end up having two brothers named Christopher and George. So things seemed pretty normal, but at the age of seven, Robert began to get into some really weird shit. And I mean weird shit like collecting knives at seven years old. I didn't really see much else about his childhood other than when he grew up, he eventually became a heavy machinery mechanic. The whole knife thing was just very odd to me. So Robert's now an adult. In the late 2000s, he ended up hopping online and he started a long distance relationship with a teacher from Canada named Sarah. Sarah and Robert would stay up talking for hours. They would adjust their sleep schedule will do to the time difference so that they could talk more often. I know all about long distance relationships. I've only ever been in long distance relationships. My husband actually lives in Florida. So thankfully we don't have any time difference because I'm in Toronto. He's in Florida, same time zone, but I completely understand this, you know, staying up for hours at night, talking on the phone and adjusting your sleep schedules, trying to, you know, fit in as much time with each other as you can. It's very difficult. It really is. And it seems just like my husband and I, Robert and Sarah ended up falling in love despite the distance. However, Sarah was in college and she did not want to drop out and move to England. So Robert ended up being the one that would apply to move to Canada. And luckily for Robert, it seems like due to his experience in heavy machinery mechanics, he ended up being accepted for residency. He got a visa and he ended up being able to move to Canada. So this is how Robert ends up in Calgary, Alberta. And then in February of 2013, shortly after moving, Sarah and Robert end up getting married. They would end up buying a townhouse together. They had a son together. They had a dog named Axel. The perfect family and love story, you'd think. But just four very short years later, they would end up getting divorced. And their divorce papers cited that Sarah had made claims that Robert had been emotionally abusing her for years. Sarah being quoted saying, he told me I was crazy. He told me I was nuts. He called me useless and worthless and told me I needed psychiatric help. She also claimed that Robert told her that she had ruined his life by having a baby and a dog that he did not want. According to Robert, everything was Sarah's fault. Yet, despite everything being Sarah's fault, Robert also couldn't keep a job because he kept being accused of stealing things from his workplace. He was drinking and smoking pot on a daily basis, which I'm sure it wasn't in a casual way or it wouldn't have been brought up because... It's legal in Canada to smoke pot. You know, it's not like a taboo thing here. So if it's being brought up, clearly it was something that was an issue and it was not like a casual recreational thing for him. And as I said, Robert blamed everything on Sarah, which I'm not going to, I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of things, but I'm sure you guys can get where I'd kind of going with that. According to Robert, Sarah's the reason that his life sucks. And it just blows my mind that he blames her for having a child when he literally participating in, you know, having sex that created that child. He knows what happens when you have sex. Babies can be made. They clearly made an adult decision together, a consenting decision to do that. And a child came of it and he's blaming solely her for it. Like, I don't understand. Okay, so Robert keeps losing his job. He's drinking excessively. He's smoking pot all the time. None of that is 
too, too crazy until we end up getting to the charges that Robert would start building. Robert would end up being charged with three counts of animal cruelty. And this was after he left the family dog Axel tied to a tree in the mountains without food or water. He just left the dog up there to die. Robert also admitted in an affidavit to having a firearms license, several guns, including two handguns, a shotgun, along with over 60 knives in his collection that he started when he was seven years old. It's like guns are just not really a thing in Canada like the U.S. So the fact that he has these handguns and stuff also just sketches me out. But in Canada, I just find it really odd that you'd have, you know, a firearms license that wouldn't be, you know, for hunting. Now, on top of all of this, in the weeks leading up to their separation, Sarah found some really questionable searches on their computer, including an article on a mother and child who died in a house fire and another on a dog being chained to a tree, which is really strange considering what he would end up doing to Axel. Now, all of this made Sarah question if she had just dodged being murdered. Sarah also was quoted saying that Robert had emotionally destroyed her and that she feared for her safety as well as her son's. And so hearing all of this, it makes sense that after those four years after Robert came to Canada, Sarah wanted a divorce. And now I am all for long distance relationships. As I said, I am in one, but you really have to be careful about who you're meeting online and who you're talking to. Now, people like this normally act very, you know, normal and non-controlling, et cetera, until you know, get married or you move in together and then they have you alone. And then, you know, that's when the switch flips. I'm not at all blaming Sarah at all for any of this. This is hundred percent Robert, obviously, but it's just, I think this is a good lesson. You know, be really careful, not even just in long distance relationships, but just in, you know, relationships in general, who you're, you know, inviting into your home and into your life. So after all of that, Sarah and Robert get a divorce. Sarah ends up obtaining a no contact policy after gaining a restraining order. Sarah also got full custody of their four-year-old son, Robert only being allowed supervised visitation. So Robert is now a single man running around Calgary. And this is where we go full circle back to the day where Jasmine meets Robert and finds him on the dating app. They catch feelings. Jasmine and her daughter move into Robert's home. We talked about how their relationship started off to seem pretty rocky, but he was really good with Aaliyah, which was thankful. But as it seems, his theory would repeat itself because of Robert seems to have an issue where he doesn't like getting tied down, despite his actions showing that he wants to be in a relationship, which I've known way too many guys like this. I have had guy friends like this. It just blows my mind and it makes no sense. Like they act one way saying like, oh my God, I want a relationship so bad. I want to be with her, blah, blah, blah. But then as soon as they get what they want, they immediately don't want it. And they just want to be a player. They want to go out. They want to see other girls cheat on their girlfriend, their wife, whatever it is. And makes no sense. But hey, Robert seemed to be one of these guys. He did it with Sarah. And now it seems like he's doing the same thing with Jasmine. Invites her to move in with him. They're living together. They're co-parenting her daughter. But then Robert just decides that it's too much for him. He doesn't want to be in a committed relationship. And he ends up re-downloading the dating apps once again. But it's just something like women know that something is up. We have like this intuition when something is wrong and Jasmine was no different. She noticed right away that Robert was acting different, probably starting to pull away more, not being as touchy. And Jasmine even mentioned to her sister that she felt like something was off. This is where Genevieve would come out and say that she found that their relationship was really strange from the start. And eventually Jasmine would end up trying to confront Robert about cheating, which he, you know, vehemently denied. But deep down, Jasmine didn't believe like Robert was telling her the truth. They would eventually break up and Jasmine would end up texting Genevieve saying, it's not working out and I'm not happy. But yet they still stayed together. Like they broke up, but they were still living together. It's still together. It was very strange. Now, somewhere in this time frame, Jasmine would also end up getting pregnant again. But the pregnancy would end up being terminated months before she went missing. And despite all of this, like they broke up, still living together. They ended up like getting back together, I guess. It, it's very confusing. They were like very off and on, but like living together, it seemed like. At least that's the impression that I got. Monday, April 15th of 2019, just six months after Jasmine and Aaliyah moved in with Robert, the three of them went to a family gathering with Jasmine's family. Video surveillance would show Jasmine and Aaliyah in a grocery store that day, and this footage would be the last known footage of the two. Then on April 23rd, which was over a week later after that video surveillance footage, Jasmine and Aaliyah would fail to show up to Easter dinner, which was not like them. And Jasmine's family would quickly report her and her daughter missing. Now, this is where things get very strange and start pulling into the Chris Watts territory. Because the next day on April 24th, authorities would attempt to locate Robert, and they would show up to his townhouse and spend 
hours knocking on his door. And then eventually Robert would come and open the door. And in the footage that police filmed, you can hear them asking Robert why he didn't answer the door for hours. And Robert would claim that he didn't hear them because he was drinking and smoking and fell asleep with earplugs in. So I'm going to play this footage for you now. It's a little bit lengthy, but I found it very interesting. And this is, again, one of those things where people relate Robert to Chris Watts. Just look at his demeanor in this clip very strange. He just gives off very odd vibes, just the way he's acting and the way he says things, the police and how he acts about his girlfriend and his girlfriend's daughter being missing. He fully acts like they're just roommates and that they weren't in a relationship. It's so weird. So I'm going to play that for you guys now to look at. How's it going? So she's with her sister. Hmm. Well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Take a quick look around. We need to have a look. So, sir, you're Robert? Yeah, I am. Okay. So. I was sleeping. I sleep with plugs in and. Hey, well, we've been here for hours and hours and hours now, hey? Uh, banging on your door and. Ringing on the doorbell. Calling your phone. Door, yeah. I, I'm, I've been drinking and smoking a lot, so. I'm okay. Up okay, door. so. She's not with her sister. What do you mean? Well, that's what? the reason that we're here. Why do you think we're here? Is that the family's calling us, saying we haven't heard from our daughter and our sister. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, that makes sense? Yeah. Okay, why does that make sense? Because I haven't heard from her either. Okay. So, do you guys get in some sort of argument? No, not that I'm aware of. Well, not that you're aware of. Like, you're not making a whole lot of sense no, to me, like, guy. Like, like, I don't know what. What? what I'm sorry, I'm, I'm still getting my bearings here. So she's not with her family, but she did threaten. To move out. I don't know, like three weeks ago, we got into a, a tizzy. She she threw a bunch of my stuff out, food and stuff like that. And I had a discipline to talk about that. Um, but nothing like that would concern me. Nothing that would concern you. Okay. Like, I mean, I've, I've, had, I've had people living with me before, and they move out. You know, right, but this isn't just like a roommate. This is your girlfriend. No, it's more roommate than girlfriend. Okay. She's more of a roommate than a girlfriend? Yeah. So, the last time that you saw Jasmine was when? Thursday. Okay. And at that time, you guys were A-OK -okay or fighting, or what was the status? I would say in the air, judging by what obviously has gone down. Strange, huh? Now, after all that, when police left, Robert ended up deleting texts between him and Jasmine and over 36 photos of Jasmine and Aaliyah, as well as firearms, which of course police would end up recovering. And this made Robert look even more suspicious. I don't even know why he went and deleted all this stuff. I am going to be honest. I think he's an idiot because everyone knows that no matter if you delete things on your phone, like the police can still go back and find this stuff. It's not that hard for them. The very next day on April 25th, the case would end up turning from a missing persons case to a homicide case. Robert also ends up losing his job this day. And when he arrives home, the SWAT team shows up with a search warrant. So things aren't looking good for Robert. Robert's not having a good day. But to make things even stranger, when the SWAT team goes into the house and starts searching the home, they find out that Robert had barricaded his front door with poles, as you can see in the photos I'm going to have up on the screen. He had also put plastic wrap on the window so no one could see inside. He had put a master lock on his bedroom door. And then the kicker for this, to make this case even stranger, the police would find 
raw bacon scattered all over the home. Like he had pieces draped on the back of dining room chairs. I think he had some like on the garbage. He had some like in the basement in this like drainage thing. Like Robert was trying to put bacon around the house, throw off police dogs. So from there, of course, Robert is going to be taken in for questioning. And I didn't find much about this questioning, but I do know that the very next day he is released and he ends up at a bar where he goes and he drinks while he's waiting for his home to be released back to him. And this is where we end up getting this very strange interview with the media that accompanies that body cam footage that I showed you guys a couple of minutes ago with the police that makes people say that Robert Leeming is the Canadian Chris Watts. So keep in mind in this footage, Robert just came into the bar. He's drunk. These people are interviewing him and he just says the weirdest things. Okay, ready to go. Okay. Uh, so the first question is the easiest, just so we have the proper spelling. Your first name and your last name. It's Robert Leeming. L-E-E-M-I-N-G? Correct, yes. Excellent. So, uh, I mean, it's it's been a whirlwind couple of days, big investigation. What can you tell us about um, your experience with this in the last two days? Yeah, I can. I was uh, arrested by the uh, tactical team. Um, it's pretty extreme <laughs> from my experience. Um, been charged with nothing, but it says the man that they released is is still a suspect so correct. is that your understanding of that to you from what i understand yes correct so do the police just have this very very wrong what's what's yes. your perspective I, they have it wrong as, as far as i'm concerned of course they do tell me about the uh the day where you took um uh, her out uh, for beers uh out of the day use area um what happened there nothing we had beers some food came back came back to my house here and um, nothing unusual. So was she living there at the time? Correct. Okay, so just so I understand how the situation goes, you own the house. Correct. Um, she she and is a tenant, is a tenant along correct. with Aaliyah? With her daughter. With her daughter, yes, correct. Okay, so the, that was the extent of your relationship. She rented from you. Correct. And you shared the home. Correct. Um, was there any romantic involvement between the two of you, or is there? There was initially, but um, towards the end, no. Um, so why do the police think it's you? Why, why are you the prime suspect? Just because you live there? Yes. Uh, I was the last person to see them. That's why. And when did you last see them? On the Thursday at around 7 p.m. And, uh, and you said that you were, um, and what, when did you become romantically involved with her? On and off in, in, in that six month period. Yeah. So you're saying the last day you saw them was the 18th. Where, where were they going? What were they doing? It was, they were just in the house. And it was about seven o'clock at night. So you left the house? Correct. And when you came back, they were no longer there? Correct. Were you not sort of perplexed as to where they'd gone or why they were gone for five days? No, because they said that they were going to be having Easter with her sister, so of course nothing alarmed me, um, until of course I got arrested, <laughs> so. How are you feeling throughout all of this? <laughs> um, traumatized, of course. <clears throat> um, it's been a very, um, very stressful experience, of course. Are you worried about them? Of course I am, yeah. They should be home. They all, or where they, wherever they want to be. But I don't know where that is. Now this is where things get interesting. A week or so goes by and the police don't have enough to arrest Robert. They need to find out what happened to Jasmine and Aaliyah and find their bodies. So on May 5th of 2019, two men end up approaching Robert while he's outside of a liquor store. And these two men end up telling Robert that they recognize him from the interviews he had done. And they let him know that a nosy neighbor claims to have found evidence on him and that this information might be of importance to him. And they tell Robert that they're willing to help him get rid of this evidence as long as he does something in return for them. Of course, Robert is the suspicious and he ends up asking these two men if they're law enforcement thinking that if he asks them that they have to tell him if they are or not which in Canada police do not have to 
And I'll break it to you now. Of course, the undercover cops have denied being police. They continue by offering Robert to go into a bar nearby to grab a beer so they could chat a little bit more. So Robert agrees to this and the two undercover officers then start to give Robert tips on how to stay under the radar. And they also start, you know, talking shit about the police, trying to make Robert feel more comfortable that they're, you know, not cops. The undercover officers end up offering Robert a ride to a covert location, which turned out to be a warehouse to do some criminal activity. And they would arrive to this warehouse around 8.15 p.m. At this warehouse, Robert is shown a bunch of guns. And despite all of this, Robert is still a little bit skeptical about this whole situation. And he was quoted saying, I don't know how it works here in this country. If I ask if you're cops, you have to tell me, right? He also was quoted saying, you heard and seen what entrapment is, right? And the police tell him, you know, of course we do. Yes. And they're lying, of course, because legally this doesn't fall under entrapment. So eventually Robert ends up getting comfortable enough with these two undercover cops that when these cops offer to help him relocate the bodies of Jasmine and Aaliyah and, you know, help get rid of them, Robert would end up agreeing. And at 4 a.m. on May 6th, so just a few hours later, Robert would lead the two undercover officers right to Jasmine and Aaliyah's bodies. This is some pretty wild police work and I commend this police department. But what happened to Jasmine and Aaliyah? How did they go from going to a family gathering, being seen on surveillance to completely disappearing and Robert leading two undercover cops to their bodies? So April 16th would be the last known day that Jasmine and Aaliyah would be seen again. I'm pretty sure this is according to Robert and this is at the townhouse. And then somewhere between April 16th and 17th is when police believe that the two would be brutally murdered. Now I'm about to talk about child dying. So if you're not comfortable with that kind of stuff, I'd recommend clicking out or skipping ahead. But I think this is very important information to what ended up happening to Ali and Jasmine. Now, also keep in mind that this is all according to Robert. So according to Robert, he claims that he picked up Aaliyah from daycare that day while Jasmine was going to an interview. He claimed that they got home, Aaliyah had a snack, and then he caught her climbing a set of stairs, which she then fell down. Robert was quoted saying, I heard a thump and I saw her lying on the ground. She seemed all right. I picked her up and dusted her off. He later would end up putting Aaliyah to bed, and when Jasmine came home, the two of them ate dinner together and watched some TV. 45 minutes later, Jasmine would end up going into the room and checking on Aaliyah, where she realized that something was wrong. And Robert said, I picked her up and found she was limp and unresponsive. He said Jasmine wasn't able to revive Aaliyah, so he went downstairs to get his phone, and this is where Jasmine ended up confronting him. He said, we're both in the kitchen, we're both crying, and we're both shouting at each other. She stood up to me and pointed at me and asked if I had done anything to Aaliyah, continuing to say, I freaked out, I snapped, and I hit her in the head with a hammer. I remember hitting her twice. He claimed to then stand there for a while, looking down at Jasmine, saying she was dying and I wanted it to stop. I went to the garage and picked up a 22 and shot her in the head. It was the only thing that I could think would be quick. <sighs> so instead of calling 911, he decided to put Jasmine out of her misery like a lame horse or an old dog in the 1950s. Makes a lot of sense, right? Robert would even agree while he was on trial that he could have helped Jasmine, but he didn't. He was, however, very adamant that he had nothing to do with Aaliyah's death, that he did not hurt her and that he loved her. So both Jasmine and Aaliyah are dead now. Robert then decides to attempt to cover up the entire thing. He attempted to use rolls of paper towel to mop up the blood from bashing Jasmine's head in. He then rolled both of them in blue and black blankets. He'd put them in the trunk of his 2014 Mercedes. And this is the very car that he would later laugh how it couldn't be tracked because it was a later model. But after their bodies were in the trunk, he then spent the next few hours drinking and cleaning up his home. April 17th was roll around. Robert now has some very major decisions to make because he has two bodies in the trunk of his car. This is when he decides to drive the bodies west of Calgary to an area called Bragg Creek. And Bragg Creek is a small town with a population of around 600 people. So it's a little more remote. Here, there's a large wooded area where people do like outdoor activities, like hiking and camping. It's a lot more remote than Calgary. And according to Robert, he sat there for a while drinking and smoking, as it seems that's all Robert does. And he was trying to build up the nerve to dispose of his dead girlfriend and her child, but he essentially chickened out and he didn't do it. So he can kill someone, but he can't deal with, you know, covering it up. So Robert's chickening out. He drives back to the city. He like takes some time to pull himself back together to get the nerve to dump the bodies. And then he ends up finding another remote area that's just north of Bragg Creek. And this is where he would take the bodies of Jasmine and little Aaliyah out. He ended up pouring gasoline on their bodies. And his excuse for this was so that wildlife wouldn't get to them. And he later would return with a big load of mulch in his car so that he could cover them with it. He eventually buried the mother and daughter together in a shallow grave. Robert being quoted saying, I didn't want them to be apart, so I left them together. How nice of you, Robert. 
how nice of you to murder both of them and then bury them together instead of just letting them go or, you know, letting them live or even after you assaulted Jasmine, getting her help. How nice. How nice of you to bury them together. You're such a great person. Let's get a little bit into the autopsy. So the autopsy for Jasmine would show that she died from blunt force trauma to the head with three separate fractures to her skull. One even extended down to the base of her skull. And she had also been shot with evidence from a gunshot wound behind her left ear and two bullet fragments that were recovered during autopsy. So just as Robert claimed, the autopsy kind of determined that the blunt force trauma occurred before the gunshot wound happened. So the story kind of lines up there. Now here's where things don't line up. And that is with Aaliyah's autopsy. Aaliyah's autopsy also showed that she died from blunt force trauma, revealing that she had suffered a traumatic injury to her head and bruises on the side of her face and neck. She also had bleeding in her brain, and it was determined that she would have died about three to six hours after the injuries without medical treatment. Now, what I wondered after hearing this is if these injuries would be consistent with Robert's story of Aaliyah falling down the stairs because a young child like that, she was not even two years old yet falling down this case of stairs in the townhouse, which you can see in the photos. I'll put it back up on the screen right now, the staircase. It's a big staircase. So depending where she fell down from, tumbling down that staircase and landing at the bottom, she could have injured herself very greatly. Anyone falling down a set of stairs like that would hurt themselves to some degree. Now, if you remember Robert's story, Aaliyah fell down the stairs. He went over to her, picked her up, dusted her off. She looked fine and she seemed fine. But the autopsy showed that she had traumatic injuries to her face, head, neck, and that she had all these this bruising. So would it take that long after she fell down the stairs for all this bruising and stuff to appear where she didn't look okay? Because Robert says she looked fine after she fell down the stairs. But according to the autopsy, she did not look fine. So did she actually fall down the stairs, get severely hurt, and Robert just panicked and put her to bed? Which is the last thing you want to do if a child has a concussion or anyone has a concussion or has hurt themselves like that is to just go put them to sleep? Or did Robert actually do something to her? And if according to the medical examiner, she didn't die for around three to six hours after this brain injury... Could she have been also saved if she did fall down the stairs and then Robert took her to a hospital? It makes you question a lot of things. Another thing I seen mentioned was that Jasmine and Aaliyah were both found with blue plastic bags over their heads. And when one of the guys had asked Robert what Jasmine had done to make him so angry that he did this to her, he replied by saying she wanted too much, she wanted to get married, and that Jasmine had known that he was seeing someone else. He even told the undercover cops about the bacon that he put around the house and admitted that he had put bacon around the house to try to mislead the cadaver dogs because bacon would smell close to like humans, I guess. So does that not kind of remind you of Chris Watts? Robert allegedly admitted to the undercover cops that Jasmine was just too much. She wanted too much from him and that he was seeing someone else and that Jasmine was catching on and it just kind of seemed like Robert just couldn't handle it. Just like Chris Watts can handle it when his wife wanted more from him, wanted him to, you know, stop going off and cheating on her. And so he instead killed her. Of course, after all of this, Robert Leeming was quickly arrested and he was charged with two counts of second degree murder. Now, surprisingly, he would plead guilty to Jasmine's murder, but he pleaded not guilty to Aaliyah's murder, which honestly makes sense to me that he's denying Aaliyah's murder. He would want to because people in prison who hurt children aren't treated very well. So he's going to be real tough guy saying, yeah, I killed my girlfriend, but he's not going to say that he killed the child because <laughs> he would get his ass beat in jail. Despite all of his denial, though, he would be found guilty on both accounts. Now, he hasn't yet gotten sentenced because this case is only a couple years old, but I will keep an eye out looking for what his sentencing will be, how many years he's going to go to jail for, all of those kind of details. But I also wanted to mention that the judge would point out that he felt that Robert had lied through his testimony, pointing out out that the autopsy showed a fall could not have done the damage that Halia had. So just like I thought, which I was really curious about was if the fall down the stairs could have been, you know, what happened to Aaliyah. And then maybe afterwards, you know, she maybe died from a concussion or whatever because he put her to bed. According to experts during the trial, Aaliyah falling down the stairs would not have resulted in the injuries that she had, which means that Robert allegedly also beat Aaliyah to death. That poor little innocent baby, she couldn't even fight for herself. I don't even want to imagine what he did to her after hearing what he did to Jasmine, where he beat her in the head with a hammer and then shot her to put her out of her misery. Robert Leeming tried to lie his way out just like Chris Watts had done. And just like Chris Watts, he ended up leading law enforcement to the bodies of his loved ones that he ended up senselessly murdering. A mother and her baby for no reason other than he wanted to go out and be a player 
instead of just getting a divorce or breaking up and, you know, kicking them out of the house. So how do you feel about this one? Do you see the similarities just like I do? Let's have a chat about this case below. I'm really curious in your guys' opinions on this case or if you found any other information that I didn't include today. This is like honestly a case that I didn't hear about. I don't know why this case isn't on national level just like Chris Watts's was because, because there are so many similarities to it. And as always, if you guys enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and hit that subscribe button if you want to continue to talk true crime with me. And of course, the more you support, the more time I can spend making these videos and spreading the word about these cases. I hope you guys have a great day. Stay safe out there and I will see you in next week's case.